punks uh it's shinobi and we're bringing you season premiere of black digest episode 211 at black height 621,522 on friday the 13th of march oh god during the apocalypse oh god. did you not know that i didn't realize that until now i was just gonna i was just gonna say something like this is the apocalypse season and then you said it was friday the 13th <laughs> Oh. Yep. The simulation is laying the memes on thick. Yeah, well, we just got done watching the uh, press conference about the coronavirus from Trump, and we've just been experiencing about a good 36 hours of like a market shock to uh, the system about this thing really playing out and pandemicking. And I'm starting to... I'm, just 24 hours, not even 24 hours into a quarantine, the, the memes are real thick, dude. I'm tasting them. Well, I mean, they launched is, a website. Yeah. I mean, you know, say what you want about the press conference. And I think we should probably just I touch think we lightly should not on say this. Anything. No, I, it's, no, it's just, no. <laughs> it, it, is, it is what it is. And, you know, the, this is going to be a fucking shit show. And everybody should count as little as possible on things you can't handle yourself as they can like point blank yeah i mean there's a reason i'm in bitcoin there's a reason i'm and quarantining myself there's a reason why i've been taking my diet and exercise and everything very seriously because you know you don't can't really count on anybody except yourself like uh the system is not really built to be uh this expansive and this uh it's interconnected for this sort of problem, and it's really uh, exposing a lot of weakness. And uh, we're definitely seeing that in the market. And uh, you know, yeah, I don't know why. I'd probably expect like uh, anything other than just you know something to try and instill some market confidence. I mean, like, I mean, we are coming in hot off of this. I mean, it hasn't even been an hour since then. So like, we'll see how the market reacts. You're right. Mm -hmm. That's... Speaking of uh, speaking of market movement, I just want to point out uh, Architect posted in the chat that apparently Bill Gates is leaving Microsoft's board. Like, what is Microsoft going to do without Bill Gates? <laughs> yeah, I'm betting that we'll see a lot of people disconnect from companies in the coming couple of weeks. Uh, this is this is going to be the most fucked up kind of market meltdown and disjointedness that any of us have ever lived through. Yeah, I mean, like, I've been trying to not freak myself out too much, but also take it seriously. And, uh, you know, I've been paying attention to the numbers, like, because uh, here in Colorado at the beginning of the month was like some of our first confirmed cases. And, it's like now it's still consistently testing above 10%. And I mean, like that's, you know, they've only been able to test about 500 people, 600 people now, and 73 have tested positive. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty good bit over 10%. So, uh, you know, I'm just, just kind of exposing that on the population and saying that's probably about 10% of the population that I'm interacting with right now has this virus. So that's why I chose to just, I mean, like, you know, this is where it's all about just looking after yourself. And for the past, like, ever since they started announcing this, I was, like, just loading up on food. And luckily, I've already kind of switched over my diet, getting ready for this. And I mean, it doesn't really feel like I'm being stupid anymore. And I just hope that uh, even if I, am, if I do turn out where it feels like it's stupid later, then good. That means not many people have been hurt, but... I'm basically, yeah, prepared for this thing to be, uh, well, yeah, those test results going all the way up. 
Mm -hmm. I'm only prepared for the numbers to stay where they are because I like the numbers where they are. <laughs> where, like, yeah, I would get, don't want to ask where they are, but I mean, like, uh, in Europe, they're pretty bad, I know. And in uh, Italy, that's where they, like, really shut off. I mean, today, they started that travel ban. I mean, 10% here is really high to me. Like, just like, I haven't felt like I've that, heard that much reported where it's like, 10% or more, but it's like, since they started doing testing, it's been consistently around 10%. Yeah, so if anyone didn't get my joke, uh, our dear leader, uh, when the uh, cruise ship uh, docked at San Francisco, dear leader said that uh, he doesn't want them to get off the cruise ship because he likes the numbers where they are. So I wasn't saying that I'm not prepared for the numbers, I'm saying he's not prepared for the numbers. Oh my god, did you hear about the cruise ship bailout? Dude, this is gonna that kind of shit is gonna ripple literally down through the entire economy. Like, I don't get how people are failing to grasp the situation we're in. Everything is gonna have to get money printed through this, from major corporations all the way down to the small businesses and the individuals. Like, what are what are we're we all just gonna take on a mountain of debt? while we pause the economy and then just start it again with that mountain of debt. How does everybody deal with that? Like the, this is a massive slippery slope that just leads to helicopter money. Hey, well, silver lining, no more crypto cruises. <laughs> yeah, that is a nice silver lining. But you're right, man. I mean, the Fed did it. They enacted the helicopter money uh, yesterday, like uh, $1.5 trillion, And uh, it is looking like um everybody in these i mean this is where dude, we're fresh into this are they going to actually buy back i don't know that's just the stock stimulus dude that's not even getting started like that's what i mean like everything is gonna need a little cash infusion yeah man jack on our cash apps and uh you know we need a little cash infusion there yeah some like, uh, promo code corona 19 or something like this, this is gonna be a very Twilight Zone esque couple of months. Could you imagine if Jack did that and there was like a uh, buy the dip promo code for Corona nineteen? <laughs> Everybody got twenty bucks to buy the dip right now because this dip is pretty heavy, man. I'm like trying to hold myself into this quarantine and not go take out a loan because the price fuck friggin' fell, man. And we are still down here. We'll see if we recover, but we're uh, sitting there around fifty five hundred. Well, we'll probably get into payment app stuff for a couple of the stories later, but like you know, cash is a thing that actually has a lot of biological shit on it, bacteria and crap, and it's a very potentially risky way this can spread. So everybody's like banks are quarantining cash at this pretty much. Um, or at this point, pretty much, to guarantee that it's sterilized by the time it's recirculated. Like, there is going to be a major, major push at trying to to get rid of, of cash with, with this as a, a big narrative behind it. Like, that has failed everywhere they keep trying it. Like, th th this is going to be put to use. It's just evidence. Like, right now, it's like, that's the thing people want. People want cash. They want some sort of stability in this moment. It's like, we've got reports of people cashing out their Bitcoin in this moment. I mean, that's where it's like the price is doing this. It's like, people need some sort of security. And it's like, what's the secure thing? And it's like, is it groceries? Is it this? Is it like, some, a lot of people just elect cash. It's an easy sort of go-to, but it is, it's German-fested and, you know, Right whenever they started reporting this virus and they handed me some change for, and I used some cash, I was just thinking like, man, I wish I could get this change in the cash app. Yeah. And, you know, that's one thing I want to touch on, you know, actually before we kind of jump into the stories. But, you know, it's I've seen like everybody's dunking on the oh, store of value broken, oh, decorrelated asset because Bitcoin has crashed like crazy along with everything else in the past day or two um like that that's a, a nonsense argument like when you are talking about a shit show of this type of proportion where everybody at the same time needs cash right now for the things they need 
there is nothing that is going to be uncorrelated to that need. If, if you have value that's not already cash and you need cash to get your shit, you're going to sell that for liquid cash. It doesn't matter what it is. Like that is not a, a breaking or a, a disproving of Bitcoin's use in that regard. It's a demonstration of how fucked up this is getting. Well, I don't even think it's that. I think the the majority of the sell pressure is the institutions who, you know, the stock market's suffering and probably a bunch of their other bags are suffering. So they're like, what can we sell right now to prop ourselves up a bit? And they're going to sell Bitcoin because at the end of the day, they don't care about it. It's something they just have in their portfolio because it performed well and they think it's generally going to perform well. But I, I don't think this is your average Joe sell. What I actually see is a lot of average Joes who are buying in because they think, wow, it's super low again. This is my time to buy, which is not, not advice that you should buy now. I'm just saying I think it's mostly institutions who are selling and not not people. That's absolutely not the the whole of it. Like if, if we were in a hyper Bitcoinized world right now where everybody just used Bitcoin as money, the purchasing power of Bitcoin would be dropping like a rock right now because people would just be demanding that much more for the actual things everybody's want. Like that this is just a systemic shock through the entire economy. And the fundamental dynamics of it would be exactly the same for Bitcoin in a a post hyper bitcoinized world or right now like it's the same underlying dynamics like you're saying I mean, this yeah thing. i'm not yeah i'm not saying that you don't have individuals who are selling you probably do have a lot of people doing that but i think most of the sell pressure is from the institutions who bought in in the last couple of years because they wanted it in the portfolio yeah i mean you could definitely argue that the uh the ico boom of 2017 and like all the institution that's come on since then like uh, has certainly brought in a lot of the market cap and you know right now there's a lot of that pain all across all markets and i think that's what you know she knows saying too is like these like black swan events like yesterday where it's just like you know well this whole thing has been like correlated uncorrelated correlated uncorrelated it's like but a move like that it's like everything gets correlated down except for multi-collateral die that managed to stay up somehow But for sure, the sell pressure was a lot of institutional buyers that had become on in the past couple of years. I mean, they were the ones that were, I, you know what, we went from 1,000 to 20,000 pretty quick. So, you know, where we're at right now still isn't that bad year over year. Let me put it another way. It's, it's not like just these institutions are selling shit because they don't care about Bitcoin. It's, I need liquid cash to cover needs now. And that applies for Joe Blow on Main Street, a single guy who's wealthy, an institution. It doesn't matter. Like that's what's going on right now. It's it's not because the the guys in Wall Street and that money are just pussies. It's because everybody is getting crunched with that I need cash right now. Yeah, it's been a pretty disastrous thing to say the least. It's not just us and the stock market, it's the oil market. It's and then, and then you know that affects the dollar and this is all where, you know, a pandemic and everything grinding to a halt really just exposes a weaknesses of like this sort of over expansive system. Mm -hmm. So, I guess that goes pretty good into our first story. I mean, uh, you know, Bitcoin 2020 conference I mean, that's been the talk for a while now. We've seen uh, Tony Hawk coming in to do their press conference. Like, that was going to be a big deal to see Tony Hawk talk about Bitcoin. I was really excited to see that. But, uh, you know, the coronavirus and everything, you know, turning out the way it is, they uh, definitely are delaying that. I mean, it was scheduled for March 27th and March 28th, just a little bit later this month. They're moving it to the third quarter of 2020. So it hasn't been officially canceled or anything. but for right now, the state of California is in a state of emergency, just like we got declared a national emergency. They declared a state of emergency back in March 4th. Uh, their governor, Gavin Newsom, did that. And uh, yeah, since then, Bitcoin 2020 and conferences like worldwide have, and the NBA and other institutions have really been taking this seriously and delaying or canceling everything and issuing refunds. The... Uh, 
this hasn't issued any refunds. Uh, Bitcoin 2020 conference hasn't issued refunds yet, but uh, I think they will. If you want, let me uh, pull up the statement real quick. I think they're they're trying to just delay it, like to the other side of the summer for now, aren't they? Yeah, here they say in their statement, quote, having spent the last year preparing for Bitcoin 2020, along with an amazing group of speakers, panelists, sponsors, and partners, we're disappointed to we're disappointed to ask you to wait a few more a few more months. But we are confident that Bitcoin 2020 will still serve as the biggest and best celebration of Bitcoin in the history at this later date. We can confirm that your Bitcoin 2020 ticket will be automatically transferred to the new date, and there is nothing you need to do to in order to register for the new event. So that's what's uh, going on right now with that. And uh, there is a, a link in the show notes that could take you to the website where you can get more details on it. Yeah, that's definitely the right fucking move right now. I have kind of been pulling my hair out, screaming why the fuck are people still going to conferences the past few ones over the last month or so. Well, yeah, I in the one of the uh one of the tragedies for uh marketers right now is that they've been waiting 20 years to be able to say you know xyz 2020 uh because it sounds so trendy and now you we literally have a pandemic happening this year and there's going to be so many events that are going to miss the opportunities 2020 in their name and they're going to be like damn it we missed it why did it have to be this year yeah <laughs> They lost the marketing gimmick, but not all of them. Uh, ETH Denver 2020 went on without a hitch, and so did ETH London. And uh, unfortunately, there was a confirmed coronavirus uh, person there. I, I don't know the name of the developer that was co confirmed uh, originally, but now uh, somebody that we all know that we've reported on before, the the uh, fork manager over there, or was the previous fork manager, uh, Afri, has now uh, had, his, I think he's recently tweeted that he's uh, tested positive for corona. So this is getting serious, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad they canceled this. Yeah, so Afri attended um, ECC, and I remember maybe a day or two ago, I think I saw someone tweet that someone had been confirmed to have coronavirus. I don't know if they were talking about Afri. But there is most likely more than one person now who went to that conference who probably been infected because people didn't listen about canceling in-person events. Yeah, I mean, they did that, uh, you know, here locally. We recently had a uh, meetup and uh, the blockchain guys canceled and it was kind of a what happened moment because it was before I'd really heard this news. But once I heard the news, it was like, oh, that's probably what happened. And I mean, uh, just because of the 10% population and trying to not put the community at risk, I myself suspended all the Boulder Valley Bitcoin meetup uh, in-person uh, meetups. Like now we just hosted a remote meetup from the Dragon's Den here in the, actually in the Mile High Bitcoin studio downstairs in the Dragon's Den just uh, last night. It was actually a pretty nice hit. It was a good time. So uh, we're going to be doing the remote and virtual things and trying out different platforms because, I mean, that's just the move going forward with this sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's kind of a, a blessing to to be around in this age and time where we can all just still socialize and interact, even though, you know, I, I hope you guys are all going to be locked up in your houses. I have already been locked up for two weeks now. You see, Janine's Atta so girl. smart. You're always ahead of the curve. Like, I was like, okay, I'm going to make the call. Today's day one of a two. And you're like, I've been into it. You're good. You guys are ahead of the curve. Good job. You got to do what you can. But, you know. I was going to make a joke about how the reason I'm locked up is because it's a dungeon, but I'm not going to go there. Dark. Uh-oh. <laughs> and my cats are knocking things off the fridge. <laughs> Sure, the fridge. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Uh, let's let's jump into the next one. You know, I think this is kind of a theme that's going to come up with a few stories during the show today. But uh -huh. I wanted to look at one of the things being deployed in China to deal with the outbreak. And I know it's not directly relevant to Bitcoin per se, but I think this is 
an incredibly important thing to be aware of while this is all going on. Um, China has pretty much deployed a system with Alipay um, that just ties everybody's travel histories, interactions together in an automated system to be able to flag a- any infected person and then anyone they've come in contact to or with um, through a different color coding system in this app that Alipay deployed. Um, and you have to pretty much show like a green, you have not been exposed or confirmed infected code to, to get anywhere in the, the public transit systems that are still running or through the checkpoints that have been set up anywhere. And so this, this is a really important thing to, to pay attention to and really think about while this is all going on. Like, yes, we need to get our, our hands on data and have that to be able to accurately assess what's going on during the pandemic and respond to it. But everybody should be very wary of how the types of surveillance and information gathering systems that will be set up to do that could continue and be normalized afterwards. Because this is just a a rock in a hard place here. I mean, that's where I was kind of worried about this whole handing over our DNA to Google. And this is all about this new website. But I did even hear them talk about in the press conference about surveillance detection of (laughs) and I've even thought about this. And if I'm thinking about this, certainly intelligence agencies are thinking about this and they're probably already operating on it as far as, hey, if we really want to start detecting like people with symptoms, like we just have to start listening for a cough. As the, uh, you know, as the, hey, let's, let's start listening to people that are coughing more often. Like if they're coughing every, you know, couple of minutes, then maybe we should start, we should like keep a beat on that person and then listen to see if they start talking about a sore throat or if they start buying lozenges. And then we start saying like, yep, they're infected before they ever got tested. Dude, you're, you know, they're literally doing that kind of shit in China right now. Like literally tagging people for things like cough medicine purchases and shit like that and raising their kind of risk profile in this system because of that. Why would we think they're not doing that here? Well, because hopefully they're disorganized and incompetent enough that they just can't do that. Um, (laughs) Well, no. The, The reason they don't do it here is because we already have enough advertising surveillance infrastructure that the companies like Target and such are, I mean, there's been a number of stories about Target and how they, you know, make predictions about you based on your purchases. Like, for example, they predicted, they predicted the teenage girl was pregnant based on the fact that she was buying things that they believed were indicating that she was pregnant and then sent an email or something to her house or and then her dad noticed and that was how he found out um so (laughs) the intelligence agencies don't have to do that kind of legwork that's done by companies but But of course they're going to be looking at that it's about formalizing it and instituting it because like point blank what is going to happen in china in my opinion out of this is they were already trying to slow roll out the social credit system in pilot programs and cities and slowly spread that out this is it, it, this is going to accelerate that exponentially at the other side of this for them it will be completely deployed and rolled out everywhere and this pandemic will be what allowed them to do that so quickly yep. yeah it's really hard to say like uh i mean this is where it's like i imagine that they are doing that except here they are using it to sell stuff to us where there they're using it to you know actually enforce like who gets to go outside and not mm-hmm. so i guess it's just how you actually implement the uh how you use the information is like the uh deciding factor here because uh yeah they're gonna they're gonna it's gonna do they're gonna use it they're gonna do it yeah but hopefully i ordered these stories properly and janine can give us a little comic relief to to bounce into (laughs) well it's it's not too much comic relief it's uh people you know like uh google um supporting de-anonymization and such but 
Anyway, back in late February during the hiatus, um, I noticed that Sarah Jamie Lewis was tweeting about the Zcash wallet or Zek, it's Zek wallet. Um, but it is like, I think it is one of the main wallets that's actually being developed by the Zcash foundation itself. And um, I guess they recently decided to move on to Electron. And as Sarah says, Electron is a hostile host for privacy-focused apps and de-anonymization bugs are everywhere. And to illustrate that very clearly, she uh, opened an issue for the wallet to point out that the app makes requests for remote resources from Google. Um, and I believe, I think this was like February 22nd, and then they fixed it within a few days after that, uh, not, not really giving any credit or saying thank you. At least they didn't do that, the issue. Um, and they were wondering why, someone wondered why it was closed so quickly, but um, that was not the end of it um, because then later on, um, this month, I think it was like March 7th or th something, she also said that there was a cryptographic vulnerability in the application as well. And she said, uh, one second, she said, um, we have to draw the conclusion that these apps are not safe to use and require serious design reconsideration before regular use. So that's uh, pretty <laughs> damning, um, but honestly not surprising because the number of times that I've gotten the impression from Zcash developers and promoters that they don't actually care that much about privacy or anonymity is uh, quite numerous. For example, the most prominent example uh, was when I noticed that, um, I think it was in 2018, they had a Zcash conference and they, after the event, they posted Google Drive folders full of photographs taken at the event. And I thought that was kind of odd because it's a Zcash conference. You think they would be a bit more privacy conscious. It wasn't like the photos were all of people smiling at the camera. It was like, you know, working shots, um, most likely people who didn't know they were being photographed. And so I asked them, did you ask consent from these people to get their photograph taken? And people were like, mm, no, not really. Uh, and then I asked, well, did you get permission from these people to have their photos posted publicly online? And of course, the answer was that they apparent they claimed that they sent out an email uh, telling people that the photographs were going to be released and if they were opposed to that then they had to email back and say i don't want my photo posted which by the way is a terrible way to handle that thing you do it the opposite way you say uh we have photos and if you would be okay with them being posted publicly then please reply to this email consenting to that but of course they didn't do that and i was literally told by the photographer himself to fuck off and because i didn't attend the event i was making a big shit storm over nothing um and then there's, you know, various interactions with uh, Zuko and other people that have really put me off. So uh, it does not surprise me at all that Zcash people are not actually as dedicated to privacy as they try to claim. For example, being super enthusiastic about a marketing campaign, giving away free de-anonymized Zcash coins on Coinbase, things like that. So none of this surprises me at all. Janine, you didn't read the one quote from the one tweet that was like what made it so funny. Which one oh, was that? So funny, the part no about what. being really high and figuring out how to make a proof of concept exploit inside like 10 minutes. And so by that assessment that it was probably being actively exploited as she tweeted about it. <laughs> oh, well, I, I completely missed that, but that is on point and that also does not surprise me. <laughs> Man, I swear, Zcash and Zuku is like Fire Marshal Bill of Mad TV, like with privacy, where it's like he's like supposed to like teach you like how to not avoid fire, but he ends up setting everything on fire. Like that's what Zuku is. Like that guy, yeah. Like and Zcash is like this whole marketing gimmick of like, hey, we're gonna bring you privacy, but we don't understand it. We kind of understand, we really, we understand cryptography and we kind of like, we like doing that, that stuff, but we don't really understand like, uh, 
surveillance and implementations and where like some major weaknesses lie and we're just going to do our thing because i mean i've witnessed it personally just like my interactions with this guy on the local scene because he's local you know i mean like i've i've run it i've run into him several times where it's just obvious he's just oblivious to his surroundings like anybody could walk up to him and just like hey and boom like and he would just totally be surprised it felt i mean as far as like people aware of their surroundings it's obvious this guy's pretty oblivious and he's just always like on the phone talking about development just openly and it, and it's just like always so like looking at him I, I the last time i saw him was in a grocery store i didn't say hi i didn't do anything but I did observe like just how many weaknesses there were in his just interacting with the public. And I was like, man, this guy's in charge of a privacy crypto. <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, kudos for the ZK snarks, but like, come on, man, this is uh, he's, he's fire marshal bill of privacy. Well, what do you and mean I also the NSA wants to look into me. <laughs> So I, I also want to point out, because some people might say, well, this is, you know, cutting edge development, there's going to be mistakes, this is new things, and, you know, don't be so hard on them. But another thing that Sarah pointed out is, um, she said, I was walking through my concerns of unnecessary metadata leakage in the light wallet, when I realized that the TLS certificate verification was turned off. <laughs> so like, they're, they're not even getting like, basic stuff, right? Like stuff that, you know, regular websites that aren't trying to do any any privacy or you know any like they get this shit right and it gets fixed fast if it gets if there is a, this kind of problem at all so the idea that like i i don't feel like i could trust them with anything advanced beyond that yeah that's uh, just priceless i think you hit the nail on the head with zcash uh back when you said it's decentralized theater whenever they turned into electric coin company and everything like i think that's and you know what it really kind of like allows them to quantify that is they really sell the whole silicon valley startup brand with a guy like zoku who's similar to vitalik hey they both get along they're both really like out there you know they got some wild ideas spin up a network to sell a token make a trillion mm -hmm. install a dev tax all right yeah that was that was a fun little comic relief thank you I for that Shanine. I think we have another one. Kaboom! Rapid fire! Yeah, so actually, I think my, my comment about the... Well, it might have also applied to... Yeah, actually, I think it was... I think it was actually Zuko who used the phrase decentralization theater. Or no, it was someone criticizing Zuko who used the phrase, yes. But um, in other uh, decentralized uh, theater productions, um, you probably noticed that um, there was a lot of problems going on with iota over the hiatus as well um basically the inner network just it just wasn't working i think i can't remember i can't remember at this point what the core issue was but i think something happened with the coordinator or they i don't know something happened where they turned they had to turn the coordinator off and basically the it iota wasn't functioning at all for like more than two weeks Strangely enough, um, again, bringing up a tweet from Sarah Jamie Lewis, um, who was like following this with kind of like a mixture of glee and horror. Uh, she pointed out that um, some of the, uh, quote, uh, credit reading uh, services, which I think we pointed out before, are usually bullshit. Uh, the credit reading stuff or the, I don't know, the ratings agencies were still rating iota as being relatively good uh even though the network was not functioning at all and i think it was at the i don't remember when iota came back online but when eventually iota was talking about you know we're going to bring the network back online um then their ratings started going down it was this very weird pattern and also the price of iota wasn't really sh it wasn't reflecting the situation at all so yeah there is a uh, linked in the description there's a um blog post by the iota foundation talking about there's actually several blog posts but they um the one i linked to was the trinity seed migration plan um and it's it's just 
it's just a clusterfuck. Um, basically, they, the seed migration plan was... Um, I'll just read a section of it one second. Uh, so they say, The IOTA Foundation's investigation identified 50 seeds whose tokens have already been stolen by the attacker. However, due to the nature of the attack, it is currently not possible to know the exact number of affected users, and all Trinity users need to determine whether they might be affected. Um, and the, the really freaky part, I mean, they've, I think they've done this before where they, they make you uh, KYC yourself in order to get your money back because there's been a few cases where they've just kind of taken people's money and they bring that up again, saying that like, if they can't, if they can't fix this issue effectively, they're going to have to do that again. Um, so yeah, they're they're recommending that passwords and seeds have been obtained by the attacker. Why? Like how? What kind of infra what kind of, you know, broken infrastructure are you running that your users' passwords and seeds get stolen like that? Um all Trinity desktop users from seventh seventeenth of December to seventeenth of February should change their wallet password and anywhere else it has been used. Note changing the password alone does not make you safe. You also need to use the migration tool. Um, but frankly, I don't know if you, I don't think anyone listening to this has IOTA, but at this point, I don't know why you would trust any kind of software that these people are producing. Um, cause what was the other thing? I think, uh, let me just go and find something really quick. Beep boop, beep boop. Yeah. I think IOTA is, oh gosh, it's one of those jokes that just gets taken a little too seriously because it's got like sound development, quote unquote. <laughs> Iota thousand dollars incoming beep boop beep boop. The network like crashed. Didn't it? it was paused. They oh, well, that makes sense. They shut it off for safety. We gotta let it cool down, guys. I remember that coordinator screwed up back in 2017, or was that 2018? Yeah, I remember the screw up, like a different screw up, similar with coordinator then. Dude, almost every problem they've had is because the coordinator fucked up and the whole system doesn't work with the coordinator. It's like so absurd at this point. Coordinator seems to be a growing problem. But I do I could I could just speak real quickly on like uh for sure I think I know why some people try to take it seriously. It's like Iota that's like run wasn't that Charles Hawkinson's friend? Uh no, he does the what the hell did they what's what's it called I-O-H-K. cordana cordana that's it and yeah. and the other i i don't know fucking hoskinson's a fucking scammer this is all bullshit these are all memes like c- come on guys look at it they they you can't turn off a decentralized system to fix a problem that's not how they work if you can do that it's not a decentralized system yeah, so I, I found what I was looking for. The um, Another reason why the whole migration process got so fucked up was that they uh, posted that they were going to open source it. And they said, many in the community have asked, why was the seed migration tool not open source from the moment it was released? Or even, why wasn't the development process done in the clear? Doesn't this violate first principles of open source? In this situation of duress, after a successful cyber attack, we hope that we can be forgiven for taking extra security precautions. With a potentially active attacker, we elected to show them, slow them down by hindering their insight into our development processes, DevOps practices, and endpoints. Now that the window has closed where this advantage was useful for our defense, uh, we have published the source code, derivative binaries, and the checksums as referenced in our blog post announcing this tool. I find this absolutely stupid to say that like he doesn't actually address the point which is the first principle of open source at least the the goal is that the reason it's open source is because it you know motivates you to design a system that you know you can know what the source code is anyone can see it and that shouldn't affect the security of the system that it runs like that is the principle. So he didn't address that at all. He just said, well, there was a potential for attack and now there isn't. It's like, okay, but you didn't, you didn't address the criticism at all. <laughs> oh my God. Well, guys, we're going to get rid of the coordinator eventually. Okay. We promise this can totally work. It's decentralized. Just keep buying. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Oh, this is where it's like, I want to see some of these like ridiculous networks. Like some of this stuff has got a, 
we got to see some. I mean, like, I want to say, I want to, before I say, like, I want to see some shock. I imagine the price did get some shock. I don't really pay attention to IOTA price, but I think it, I remember people being like, oh, what's going on here? Let's see. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess, I guess let's just jump into the next one, which is serious. So <clears throat> uh, there, there is a market watch piece that Jameson Lott brought to my attention uh published right after we went on hiatus um diving into mastercard's research division and what they're working on and i just it's facepalm like at this point i think that these people are literally retarded um the the new payment verification mechanisms they're working on are gait recognition so the exact subtle way that you walk and they're they're literally partnering right now with transit companies to to tie that into their their camera systems for public transit that's awesome um so the next one is your veins in your hand are, are a, a unique pattern in the same way a fingerprint is. So you're using that uh, as a way to verify mechanisms or, or a, a, a wristband that, that wirelessly played your heartbeat, which is also a unique rhythm. Like all of these are not just things that can be imitated, duplicated. You just flash a picture of because a lot of these biometric systems are idiotically stupid and you can never change your biometrics and then on top of that um the, these things just surveil you by the very nature of how they're architected and watch how hard this type of shit is going to get pushed during and after this as as you know like i said cash is a a very serious concern as far as a a spreading mechanism for this banks are literally quarantining and sterilizing cash from areas with massive outbreaks so th this kind of narrative is coming this this is going to follow on this the way the idea followed 9 11 that the government has to be able to to tack and track everybody for our safety because of the terrorists Th this exact type of, of reaction is going to happen except they have all the new narratives regarding cleanliness and, and and not physically touching and moving things back and forth to go off of and oh cash fits that entire abstract area yeah this is where it's like i really want to make sure that we're always working on developing this uh the implementation of bitcoin in the right way because some of this stuff can become tyrannical in the way that you could just control somebody and mastercard and yeah they don't really have the best history so uh yeah it's uh sounds pretty scary i mean this is like you know we i, I bet most everybody who's going to be listening to this you you grew up after 9 11 you saw it happen old enough to to appreciate what happened and then all the shit that happened afterwards and used that event as a justification for it like be smart realize that that's exactly how almost everybody is going to try to play this you don't let a crisis go to waste this is where like this uh covid19 thing really does like i don't know it just hits the spectrum where it's like it's 2020 and like it's all like every every discussion point about it is going to be played in a political way and yeah i mean uh, the narrative about cash and moving more towards cashless societies is uh one that's always been kind of edged towards by uh by some of these bigger countries that want to incorporate more of a surveillance state so be weary and i think you know that kind of springs us right into the next one janine of a uh, the this exact same type of stupidity except directly in this ecosystem yeah, so in the last couple of months, uh, particularly, I think a lot of stories came out in January. Um, you may have heard of a company called Clear AI, which is a startup that made headlines uh, 
for the fact that they build facial recognition technology um, on their claim. It only is sold to governments, but of course we have since found out that's not true. Um, so basically, uh, Clearview had a bit of a data leak. Uh, their client list was um, released to the world. Not, not with their consent, of course, but... Uh, we basically got to find out who their clients really are. And of course, there are a lot of government agencies, uh, not just the U.S. government, uh, but then there's a lot of corporate runs, too. So uh, internal documents obtained by BuzzFeed revealed the New York-based Clearview AI, um, a startup facing legal threats from Apple and Google, as well as calls for greater scrutiny into its practices, has already shared or sold its technology to roughly 2,200 companies and authorities around the world. Clearview software trawls websites and social media platforms to scrape data and match images posted online to persons of interest. Um, just to give an example, I can't remember which media outlet it was, but there was an article about a guy who, you know, went into a restaurant or cafe and he saw his daughter across the room uh, who is presumably on a date with a guy and he didn't recognize who the guy was. And so instead of being a normal human being and going, up your daughter and saying hi who is this who you're introducing he decided to take a photo of the guy and look him up in Clearview's database to figure out who he was and it turned out he was a Silicon Valley venture capitalist uh I don't know if, I don't think they ever said his name thank goodness but uh yeah that's the kind of people who are interested in using this crap um, so, guess what? Uh, one of the companies who was interested in at least testing Clearview was Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase was among the organizations that had used the software for at least one search, BuzzFeed reported Thursday, and I think this article is from last week or something like that. Um, a Coinbase spokesperson confirmed in the article that the exchange had tested Clearview software regarding its, quote, unique needs around security and compliance, but added customer data had not been used in any of its tests. Of course, we're going to believe them. Uh, the exchange tested Clearview AI to see if the service could meaningfully bolster our efforts to protect employees and offices against physical threats and investigate fraud, the spokesperson said. It hasn't yet committed to using the product. Um... Then they had, uh, this is in Coindesk, they have a paragraph uh, that says Coinbase had previously faced criticism about how it deals with user privacy. And of course, they're uh, linking to the very familiar uh, scandal from last March, where the exchange had to clarify that it did not sell user data after, after its director of institutional sales, who mysteriously later left. Um, said that a previous analytics provider sold customer data to outside sources. Um, Coinbase had just acquired an analytics firm linked to governments uh, with human rights abuses, and that was, of course, Neutrino. If you want to find out more about that, uh, you can just uh, search Neutrino Coinbase anywhere, and you'll find it. So yeah, um, the other really funny thing is that apparently, uh, I was not aware of this until literally this story about the data breach, but one of the lawyers that is working for Clearview is Tor Eklund. Um, strangely enough, if you, know, if you haven't heard that name before, you might have because he, was, uh, he got a lot of fame for you know defending hackers who were accused under the computer fraud and abuse act and things like that and according to a statement that he gave to media uh, after this data breach happened he uh, claims that um there's there's nothing illegal happening here because your faces are public property um yeah so good to know um about that Mm-hmm. Well, it's the con base isn't just holding up to their high name and like their uh their reputation of working with individuals like the people from hacking team and going on to do, you know, stuff that just runs right in the face of Bitcoin, like and then yeah, that's just man, they're really holding to their reputation. Yeah, I mean dude, I think it's pretty clear at this point that uh like just nope stop excuse using it stop 
rationalizing what good Coinbase did in the past. They're trying to replicate the KYC bend over Bitcoin bank in this ecosystem instead of at least just trying to trim that down a little bit. Like you're not even going to try and push with a little flex with, with how much fucking weight they have to throw around to make it a little less crazy. No, they're, they're just trying to fucking totally replicate it and then take it fucking 10 times further in that direction. Fuck them. Uh, it's just like the easy move because, uh, you know, the regulators are breathing down their throat with these Wall Street Journal pieces talking about, we need to track your coin joints. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I mean we might we're probably never going to find out but you know according to that Coinbase spokesperson they were saying that they were going to use it on employees. So I'm assuming that's you know what are the possible use cases for that? If someone's applying for a job, they're going to ask for that person to give a photo and then they're going to run it through the database to see if they have, you know, history or where they show up. Or is it going to be something like they have a kind of scanning device at their physical office where you, you know, when you, if you want to go and visit their office, they scan your face and check it in the database and see what's going on? Or if they're lying and they were planning to eventually put user data into that, does that mean that when you do the whole KYC thing with them and you give a selfie, that they're going to then put that selfie through Clearview and, you know, find out who you are and stuff? Like, I mean, those are the scenarios that I see, but like, Jesus, I would never use a service that did that to me. I don't even see banks doing that. That's clearly what they were were entertaining the idea of doing. I mean, clearly. Yeah, and there's going to be all kinds of different development around the space. And I mean, Coinbase is, they've, like we said, I mean, people for a long time have been like, hey, you know, they've been around for a long time. They helped grow the ecosystem. But I mean, like this is, there's just one too many signs that just go against Bitcoiners value proposition and the underlying value proposition of individual sovereignty with this money, I mean, and the way that it operates and the way that they're trying to just recreate this ecosystem. I mean, these developments are happening without borders. Like this technology is going to be used where, I mean, you know, here, China, somewhere. And I mean, it can be used in a tyrannical fashion. And uh, this is where it's like, yeah, a lot of this development, Some sometimes I, I hope everybody understands like what they're doing whenever they are helping spur this development in these directions yeah this well, this um, is all built on cryptography not facial recognition use the right tools well and also once again like <laughs> they they still keep saying we only have government clients we only sell to governments and yet you have this evidence now like sure i i can't remember if any companies on the client list actually confirmed that they use it, most of them were just saying, we tested it, we tested it. But of course, saying that you tested it, that still means that Clearview allowed you to test it, like they were offering it to you uh, and you were interested. So even if you're just testing it, that still means Clearview is interested in having corporate clients, even though they kept telling people we only sell to governments. So you have all of this deception going on, like no one should feel good about this. Mm -hmm. This is where you see some of these price movements and like, yeah, institutions and it's like, yeah, you know, the market has got a lot of, we got a lot of learning to do, man. They got it. And it's, it's going to take a while. I mean, for sure, in the evolution of Bitcoin, we're going to see some of these ecosystems, uh, I guess, continue to thrive. Uh, just I wish they would understand like their power and realize like what their customers want and need with something like Bitcoin and uh, try to at least stand up to some of these uh, bad articles against them and just uh, and these regulators and say like, hey, uh, we're not going to do this because we believe in our uh, client's right to financial privacy. And we think that that's something that we should stand up for because that's something that our industry stand up, stands up for. But I don't understand if these guys really under, really know what's at stake. Also, uh, thank you, Tor Eklund. Um, as a you know, 
legal mind if you're telling me that uh, you consider people's faces to be public property. Uh, you've just given me more, more reason to not show my face on the internet and keep photos of myself off the internet. So yay, I have even more rational reasons to avoid this crap. All right, time for more comedic relief. Sliding into the next one. Dun, 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 drum roll. Coinbase rolls out Bitcoin transaction batching in this super <laughs> very important medical, or, well, medical, medium article that they've published with such enthralling subsection titles as why are we doing this? And how does this work? What's this? They even have graphs where you can see the transaction fees on the network. A screenshot of what the withdrawing looks like, highlighting the network fees. See how that went down, guys? Because we finally stopped being complete retards. It's a miracle, guys. It's 2020. Three years later, they finally implemented the common sense feature that any rational business in this space has been doing. Applause. I got to hold the push to talk button. I can't applaud. I'll just snap my fingers for him because, yeah, this is like one of the most crazy things where it was like all of this uh, wild black swan event stuff. And it's just like here comes Coinbase with like, hey, don't worry, we got batching solved now, finally. And then, you know, I looked at the mempool after the tweet and like the transaction fees went up. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm actually, I was genuinely confused by this because I actually thought they had started doing batching three years ago. Did they yeah, not do that? I know that's I thought like... they literally. I thought they literally said that they had started doing batching. Like, what happened? Is that another lie that they're like, oh yeah, now we're doing it. Don't ignore the fact that we said that we were doing it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so because they did. They did talk about batching before, and they've talked about, hey, we finally got SegWit implemented. We got back 32 addresses, which I don't even think they really do. Do they have back 32? I'm not sure. But they like no. make these announcements. Yeah, you see, not even back 32. They got SegWit, but not back 32. See, yeah, this is like between this and all the surveillance, and it's just like, it's like, thank you, but like, this is like such a half measure in what you're trying, what you should be doing for the network. I mean, since you're, Coinbase and you're worth over well you were worth over eight billion. I doubt that now after today and yesterday and all that swanness. Whoopee the stunning display of competency and gumption. Yeah, just to remind people again, like the whole not batching issue was a big influence on the Brave browser creating their own stupid token on Ethereum because basically Oh, well, this was Coinbase's fault and their fault, but originally they offered a way to buy Bitcoin through the Brave browser with some Coinbase plugin. And instead of being smart and saying, well, we're going to batch the requests to buy Bitcoin together so that we're not creating a bunch of dust. Instead, they were literally sending individual orders of like $5 of Bitcoin to Coinbase and buying that. And of course, that did not work well for much longer. Um, then there was the whole thing with BitGo's multi-sig, which is a whole other clusterfuck. But yeah, Coinbase uh, uh, not being able to organize things right in a, an efficient way was part of the Braze browser creating a shitcoin. But it's okay. They made up for it, Janine. Three years later, we got batching. We got it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, proof's going to be in the pudding. We'll see it in the mempool. All right, well, I guess uh, you want to take us into the uh, next one, Rick? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, like we're saying, there's a lot of moves going forward with Bitcoin and its uh, implementation and development and how it's going to scale, and there's going to be different models. And, you know, uh, Caitlin Long in Wyoming's been working on trying to actually build out the best uh, legal framework for these sorts of institutions. and. They're doing that by applying for that SPDI license where last year they filed for that special purpose depository institution license and they passed all that to where the legal framework is there to create a 100% reserve back 
uh, bank for crypto assets or digital assets. And they finally did it with this new bank called Avanti Bank. And uh, she had this nice Twitter thread out about it and uh, releasing this out into the world to try and say, hey, you know, in Wyoming, we're going to try and create these institutions with a little bit more um, accountability for their customers. So to say, where like uh, guys like Coinbase out there, there's not really, I don't, I don't know what really holds them accountable to their customers. Really, like they're just accountable to what we were talking about earlier with surveillance and everything. That's what they like. Uh, but yeah, the Avanti Bank is going to be using uh, Blockstream uh, sidechain, liquid sidechain, in order to uh, issue some of these digital assets. And yeah, it's trying to do what the SEC needs for, is in order to create one of these crypto banks or digital asset banks, they want, quote, good control location in what the SEC labeled as like guidance for custody of these assets and how to create a legal regime for these security tokens, which like that needs to be done. I mean, if there's one thing that Bitcoin and everything's doing in this nuance of money and creating these new verifiable forms of assets, it's yeah, there are lots of ways to create uh, these token infrastructures that are more accountable and verifiable than the current economy of stocks and the way that those and bonds and those are run with all the, the counterparties and third parties. So it is interesting to see this development go forward. And, uh, you know, I really wish them the best of luck. I know that that SPDI was uh, it's hard work because of the fact that uh, – you know, anybody that goes for this is basically going to be a legal battle. And that's where it's like the first ones out the gate are the uh, the legislators there that have put together the legislation for the SPDI. They're filing for the first bank. And uh, maybe once this one gets approved and then the asset starts to roll out and custody starts to become a little bit more something that the state is familiarized with, we'll start to see more SPDI licenses get approved. And then we'll start to see more accountable banking digital asset institutions that aren't necessarily Bitcoin in the way that we would operate with Bitcoin, but more or less just a new verify, like a more verifiable uh, asset system than the current bond and treasury and markets like that. Yeah. I mean, if you want to build out that institutional side of things and actually bridge that into the space, then you just have to do this. You have to have this kind of, of financial entity to do that. And you know, I know a lot of people in this space are looking at this and probably going like, get the fuck out of here, you legacy system stooges. But this is a necessary thing if you really want these two things to function and have a well, or relatively well-greased interplay between them. Yeah, I mean... Right now, everything's trying to make their way into Bitcoin the best they can with futures products and trying to create platforms for these institutional buyers to come online. And as we're seeing right now, I mean, it's uh, it's fairly limited in scope right now. I mean, there's like, a, you know, there's Bact and there's uh, the CME futures. And outside of that, you know, as far as institutional products, there's not really much. Uh, you know, you could start going to Grayscale, you could start going to Coinbase. We, we just talked about how bad that is. Like, you know, this kind of gives like a some sort of in between option and maybe a little bit more accountable development. And it is like here on the front range. I mean, Wyoming's not Colorado, but it's right upstairs. I mean, and they're, you know, hoping to get this in. And, you know, there's a lot going on with uh, the Colorado cannabis market and, trying to get uh, proper back backing for that and banking and how exactly we're going to do that is going to probably require an institution like this. And, you know, if Wyoming's ahead of the curve on this and like push comes to shove, like, or not even push comes to shove. I mean, it's like Colorado will probably be working with Wyoming in this sort of development to try and help uh, create some sort of actual censorship resistant system for uh, that sort of econ for like censored economies. Mm hmm. So it's big news, but it's going to take a little bit of while for the to come out. Like we're saying, they're just applying for the SPDI. Uh, like they're saying, early, the goal is early 2021. We'll see how it goes. You just monitor the development, and uh, you know, I'll be in like close contact with the 
people, and so hopefully I can uh, continue to update us on this as it as it continues to move through its licensing process. Mm-hmm. And then you know, kind of a think you know. Once I get through this next one, there's like a little interesting dynamic going on here uh, that I think is going to be kind of fun to watch uh, and play or unfold. Um, well, I I have not been sleeping well lately, but um, so you don't say. <laughs> um, uh, I'm in the opposite situation. I've had the best sleep of my life over the past two weeks. <laughs> well, go to hell. <laughs> but um, if you're damn. In this- Crystal Analytics platform has added Tether support. Um, at least, you know, what, what it seems based on the, the release they made, uh, the token that's actually on the main Bitcoin chain itself. But, you know, most things have shifted over to Ethereum and probably soon to follow are going to flood into Liquid, which has confidential transactions. And I mean, I think it's pretty obvious the 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 play here that Bitfury is making is just how important stable coins like Tether are to the overall market and ecosystem. One, but two, probably just gearing up for you know many more of these things that are going to come to exist over the next decade or so, very likely, and being able to offer these kinds of surveillance tools for those and not just native crypto. And I think it's going to be very interesting as, you know, I, I think all of those types of, of tokens and stable coins are going to shift to things like liquid. So how are these chain analytics companies going to handle this big other half of the ecosystem that they want to, to track and sell services for? How are they going to handle that disappearing under confidential transactions? Like, I think that's going to be a pretty entertaining thing. I think it's going to be a pretty awesome thing, too. I mean, uh, as far as getting some real... uh, I mean, right now, you know, coin joins bring a good level of anonymity set to the network. But to have, like, uh, real, like, side chains with confidential transactions and, uh, you know, adding those in, like, uh, just bringing up the anonymity set. Like, yeah, I'm interested in, like, just seeing all that sort of development move forward. And, uh, yeah, it's one where I've been looking at all that with like lightning in and out. So it should be, uh, yeah, with liquid and lightning is what I meant. <laughs> and like how to improve privacy. It's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I actually think I'm going to flip the, the, these two next stories order real quick. Uh, I think it just makes better sense this way, but also kind of just quickly to touch on, um, bisque over the hiatus, uh, launched liquid Bitcoin support. So you can actually now move both ways um, between Bitcoin on the main chain and on liquid through a decentralized exchange on BISC. And so that's adding even more layers to like how screwy things are going to get from a chain analytics company's point of view. You can move your main chain Bitcoin indirectly to Liquid in a decentralized platform and getting into Liquid gives you access to stable coins and the fiat side of the market all without KYC. BISC has also been doing um, a lot of volume over the last month or so, right? They've been really pushing for more people to use, or no, I don't know if it was volume, but it's like record number of trades, I think actually. So that's pretty impressive. I have a really good feeling about BISC and how that platform is going to do over the next five years or so. It's going to be a very, like, I don't think it's going to blow up and become one of the biggest ways people get in and out in the space, but it is definitely going to keep growing and be a very important thing to have around. Yeah, I think I've also agree. Like, uh, BISC moving forward, I've seen stuff you know tweets about how their order books are growing and the liquidity is there and you know it doesn't take long for an order to get filled so yeah it's good to have these sort of options coming out and like we're talking about bitcoin implementations and development and scaling and you know to have some guys like this working there to where there's like these options for people that uh still offer routes where their privacy is uh thought after that's a great thing so yeah hopefully that 
I mean, it looks like it's, the development's going to keep moving in a positive direction, and the token's working out and everything. It just, you know, hope it continues that way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's uh, another platform slash type of platform that's been seeing a lot of uptick in volume, too. Yeah, I mean, just like touching on our, yeah, going into this next story, it, it looks like uh, Square Cash really uh, made a move last year in 2019, you know, they started selling Bitcoin in 2018, and at that time, you know, they were only able to rack up like a little over 100 million in sales, and like now they've gone over to like nearly half a billion, like 516 million in total gross sales on the Cash App uh in bitcoin sales so that's like uh yeah i mean as far as competitors moving into the space and like taking coinbase's lunch and people that are making waves i mean cash app's been doing it and i mean it doesn't necessarily offer the privacy enabled routes like bisc does but it does offer like easy access and it does offer a way for people to withdraw their uh, bitcoins and i haven't seen them uh you know, discriminate as to where those addresses, like, or where you're sending those outputs. So, I mean, like, uh, as far as a platform moving forward and doing good year over year, I mean, uh, Square, Square Cash and the Cash App and Jack over there are, are killing it. I mean, uh, so yeah, they did over 516 million in sales in 2019. So they are kicking it. Mm hmm. You know, it's, yeah, it is a KYC platform and that is what it is, but it's light years better than something like Coinbase for people who are personally okay with services like that. I mean, everybody's got to make their own trade-off assessment, but it's way better than Coinbase. Yeah, it's way better than Coinbase. And I mean, I know guys here locally that use the Cash App daily. Like, I mean, they do the stack and sats meme, like, religiously and you know they'll buy ten dollars worth of bitcoin every day with that because that's an easy platform for them to be able to do that to just like hey they open their uh phone and their price sticker says the bitcoin price is down they just open their cash app and click you know purchase and they do their daily purchase and they stack those sets and it's just an it's one of those memes that took off and it does allow the user easy access to do that and it is a way for uh, people to participate in the bitcoin ecosystem so yeah and they're doing they're doing good on the sales numbers and uh you know like i've i've seen a lot of people that have come into the space in the past year year and a half uh have come in through i would say uh probably about 50 50 on the cash app and coinbase route you know as far as like which one are they going to mm -hmm. well it's gonna All be right. Yeah, I guess I should take us into the next one then too. Like, uh, you know, this one is kind of a uh, switch. And like, uh, you know, these guys that are, well, I guess not really, people that are making waves in development, short bits. Like they just recently did, uh, Chris Stewart and Nadav Cohen, a local uh, Lightning developer here in Boulder, Colorado, uh, did a recent episode of uh, Tales from the Crypt. You know, I suggest you guys listen to it. But also in the show notes, we've got... Uh, a link to these uh, discrete log contracts that uh, Nadav's been working on, and uh, you know you could you guys can go and check out this blog post and uh, scour through the repo, and you know you guys can actually run DLCs on the test net right now, and uh, you know you guys can help test these things. And uh, Suredbits has been working with Crypto Garage to uh, to develop these contracts, and I mean these things could solve a big problem with. Uh, Oracle, like in the way that like uh, information is decided, and so I mean, I really just want to point as many eyes as possible to these uh, blog posts coming out of Short Bits. Uh, Nadav is a good friend of mine, and uh, he's one of these developers that's kind of been uh, just really hard at work and uh, doing a lot of good work. And uh, some of the stuff that he's come up with. He's really been thinking about taking old ideas and putting them together in new, credible ways that are actually solving big, big problems. And uh, yeah, I mean, as many de developers and guys that are listening to us, like I would just please, you know, uh, check out these blog posts as they come out. This one's an important one. There's going to be some more important ones coming out real soon. So uh, please, like, follow the blog posts and uh, follow short bits and you know, uh, and 
follow their developments and uh, try and help along if you can, because uh, what they're doing is important for a uh, for network uh, on a bunch of different levels as far as scaling and privacy and uh, and security. They're they're really working the gamut there with uh, with Lightning and Bitcoin S and Bitcoin Scala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the I know uh, like we covered and I went through kind of real quick when they started like trying to put a specification together for DLCs and like I kind of haven't had the chance to check in until yesterday uh, when I talked to Nadav for a minute but yeah they, they've made some really awesome progress uh, since they first started trying to get collaborators for a spec and you know talking to Nadav I know pretty soon they're probably going to be dropping some more uh, stuff but like DLCs like base layer lightning like doesn't matter. This is going to be a very valuable smart contract to have standardized going forward, and they've fucking been kicking ass on getting that done. Yeah, to be honest, these are one of those uh, developments in the space where I don't, I can't really quite quantify all the use cases that are going to come out of it because it is something that it's like, okay, it looks like it obviously solves this problem, but there's like new ways that you can use Bitcoin and Lightning in this fashion to uh, solve uh, problems on the ground and uh, create like these uh, trusted networks and. Uh, it's it's interesting and uh yeah if you're interested in this stuff and you're listening to us i'm sure you'll dig it too so please go check them out mm -hmm. i guess next up i'm uh, okay this is gonna be fun so yeah the hardware security module stuff dropped for the cold card mark three uh while we were on hiatus and this is fucking awesome as shit looking um I've been I've like uh, been talking to Rodolfo and we're we're just getting the season going again and obviously with everything going on got to work that out but I'm gonna try and get him back on to really go through this later but I'm gonna just try to buzz through the the big parts um so the cold card can pretty much get locked um, plugged into a device into a hardware uh, security module mode that can auto sign um based on policies you set and you can pretty much register a user like to um, get the device to sign something with a specific username identifier and you can use uh, passwords or the otp authentication like google auth stuff um, as an authenticator before the device will actually sign something and you can actually craft your own policies with things like how much Bitcoin period can move through or get signed off on in a certain time interval. And the way that works is when you get something signed for the first time, it just starts a counter that's like relative, like it's not a clock, it just counts from a start point. And it will pretty much like check through that period and while it's counting, not sign anything that moves more Bitcoin than you set until the timer gets to the end of the period and then resets and you start all over again. You can also um, set up whitelists so that it will only sign transactions going to whitelisted addresses. Um, and every output in the whole transaction has to have an address in the whitelist. Um, you can set limits on the amount of Bitcoin per, or per transaction. Um, you can craft kind of a air quote multi-sig policy where multiple users have to like provide their user proof or like access uh, mechanism to the cold card before it'll sign off. And you can do N of N or M of N combinations with that as well. You can also set up a um, like physical authenticator where in order for the cold card to sign off, you have to physically enter a code into the pad of the physical device. So a human being has to be there to still like get it to approve and sign something. And you kind of structure these in like a dependency order where it'll check the first one and then check the next one and the first time it hits something that it fails it just won't sign so you kind of have to think about the policies you construct to make sure that 
the right thing gets checked in the right order. But this is such a crazy useful thing. Oh, and also you can have it sign messages too, not just Bitcoin transactions. And I, there's a lot of really crazy interesting stuff I think you can do with that. But ultimately, um, I think that this dropping is pretty much now anybody tech savvy enough to, to work with this and build applications on top of can pretty much make their own CASA uh, company and not just the exact services that CASA offers, but you could do all kinds of crazy stuff beyond that. Like I'm already thinking how you could use something like this to have a low volume kind of e-cash Bitcoin bank that wouldn't be as private as full on Xiaomi and e-cash, but you could set it up so that you, you don't have to be a tech wizard to be the guy actually running that. And like, the, like this is just so stupid useful. Like I don't even know where to begin. Like I, I, I am not just shilling cold card and coin kite because I think that they are awesome which I do, I quite literally think that this, just this device and protocol and services for it are going to just, it, there's going to be a whole new category of software and tools and services and shit you can build in this space because of this. Like this is going to be fucking awesome. Heck yeah, man. Seeing this like kind of development going on with, uh, hardware setups and as well as like things that like we just talked about with DLCs, like I'm, this is the kind of development where it's like, no matter what's going on with guys like Coinbase or regulators of the market, it's like, you know, we have the tools that are going to be able to make sure that we can scale uh, Bitcoin and scale the ability to like uh, provide a place for people to transact with this value and make sure that it's sound. Like, I mean, it, these, these are like, uh, you know, interesting ways to solve these trust problems without having to be like a, just a new bank model. Mm -hmm. Or if you do start getting into the territory of like a new bank model, you make it distributed and local enough that there's actual trust there that's worth something and not just the illusion of it. And like, you know, I, I'm just going to gonna jump into the next thing too, because this is fucking cool. But, um, HTC, um, you know, they did the, the full node phone a while back, is dropping a 5G hub. So like a pretty much a 5G modem with a router on it for like a main internet connection. Um, that's like, it's a little touch screen, like router setup. And it's got, it's, it's pretty much running on like a, a stripped down like version of Android. It's a thing that has native applications on it and shit like that. But there, this is also set up and designed to have a Bitcoin node running on it. And on top of that, they're also looking at integrating um, direct VPN integration for the whole routers, um, like connection traffic for all the devices on it, ad blocking features and, um, integration of uh, proton mail and brave browser uh, um like as accessible apps that you can directly use through its touchscreen so like th this is really interesting this is like the whole package of 5g router because that is going to be a potential replacement for a main internet connection when it rolls out like actual privacy tools for general things rolled into it and then just a bitcoin node running on this that's it's it's click and it's there an idiot can run it and they're even um have like this the zion vault um wallet software that they have running on this so you can actually store your shit with keys managed by that so like this this is Personally, I think that the cold card stuff, the hardware module, it's way fucking cool. You're going to do way crazier shit. But this is still pretty awesome as a really comprehensive, like, here, grandma, use Bitcoin now. And, like, an attempt at that from a, a kind of different angle. Yeah, man. I mean, the note in a box model worked. There was a lot of people that were 
buying up those nodes because they're really easy to you know just get a get a node spun up and this one is like hey it's got a router built into it like it's just all good to go and like you're saying yeah the hardware wallet set up with the ck bunker i mean like that's definitely gonna provide some interesting uh use case where uh this is like just like an interesting way to just keep people looking at bitcoin as something where they look at htc i mean that's a major manufacturer and like uh you know to create a router like this it looks like a good router and hey there's a bitcoin node in it i mean you know in the world of uh bitcoin nodes i mean you know i'm always like thinking about which uh which, if i could get one which one would i get and this one's definitely going to be up there on the list as far as like debate now mm -hmm. pretty cool stuff i mean like bitcoin development i mean like this is where it's like the markets are crazy the world's in flames and everybody's hiding in quarantine or should be. And uh, Bitcoin development is going to keep moving forward. Like, uh, yeah, this stuff is robust. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I guess, uh, you know, speaking of that, uh, I think there's been a, a radical uh, decision made that we've kind of been waiting for for the giant chunk of a year uh, while we were on hiatus. <laughs> Yeah, you think a country like uh, as big as India would like take note from somebody like China to see like, hey, look, it's not really working, you know, but they they went for it. They tried to ban cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and trading of it. Like, let's see. So uh, the Reserve Bank of India had imposed a, uh, yeah, a ban in April of 2018 that barred banks and other financial institutions from facilitating any services in relation to virtual currencies, which put a big spook on the whole market to where nobody wanted to touch crypto or Bitcoin in India for a good long time now. But uh, it looks like recently that's been overturned and uh, at the beginning of this month and the, it's headed by Justice, uh, oh goodness, Nariman, I'm sorry if I just destroyed that, uh, overruled the central bank circular on the grounds of disproportionality. So, yeah, a group of petitioners, including Trade Body for the Internet and Mobile Association of India, had challenged Central Bank Circular, arguing that India should look at most other nations that are not only allowing cryptocurrency trading, but have moved to launch their own virtual currencies. So in looking at that, the uh, judge ruled against uh, the Central Bank Circular and now uh, in an, on this grounds of disproportionality. And so, yeah, that ban has now been lifted and cryptocurrency exchanges and people and businesses that want to operate in the country are now doing so freely so that's a great thing to see and yeah that's a uh that has been something we've kind of been waiting on it's like something the supreme court of india has just sort of been sitting on and sitting on and everybody's been waiting for guidance we've been waiting for guidance but in india they had that ban sitting over their heads since april of last year Earlier this month, that got lifted, so things are looking a little brighter over there. And considering their economic position in the world and populational share of the world, like that's a pretty good thing because that is a lot of people who would have had options closed off if that held. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we talk about the development of Bitcoin, one of the major ones has been the unbanked. And uh, India has like not just a uh, large unbanked population, but also a large uh, impoverished uh, population. And you know, well, that's yeah, obviously impoverished because they're unbanked. But uh, yeah, they uh, they need access to this and they need uh, to be able to develop the tech and be able to work with it. And, you know, like we're seeing in uh, in this world in 2020, it's like things move fast. And if you're sitting in this stigma of like is this thing banned and you don't know if you can operate with it and um you get put in a pinch like it could really it could really put what was a place where you could uh move forward in the world you know it not it not so so now they can hopefully they'll be able to take steps forward in the right direction and you know really step up on the global economic output with all of these people coming into the world of uh banking with bitcoin mm -hmm. And it's especially good now, given that like this, like, yeah, yeah, everybody roll your eyes when, when you look at the, the price yesterday and then listen to me like this is now 
one of the most important times to be able to access something like Bitcoin with the crazy amount of money printing that is going to have to go on everywhere to deal with this situation. Like this is when you need that, that road open. Absolutely, man. All these routes that can get uh, ability for people to get supplies and, you know, get the things they need. That's going to be uh, put to the strain and uh, all these supply chains, all that stuff's going to, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully not, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. well, I guess, Janine, uh, that's you up. I think you got two updates for us on the end I here. Think you got like some of the best news I've heard in the past 48 hours for us, I think. Yeah, so yesterday was a big day. Um, first, I'm going to start off with something that happened a little earlier, though. Um, basically, on Wednesday um, this week, uh, it was reported by Chelsea Manning's legal team that she had attempted to uh, commit suicide um, sometime that day, and she had been transferred to the hospital. Uh, and that was really sad to hear because it's not the first time that's happened and clearly that's an indication that she's um, under a lot of stress in these conditions and as she has said a number of times. Um, but then again, uh, the whole purpose of putting her in jail is to coerce her into participating in the grand jury and she stated a number of times that she wasn't going to do that even at great harm to herself that was her words um so that was really bad um but then on friday it was or not friday thursday um well the thing that we are waiting for is that today on friday she was supposed to have a hearing to address um, a motion that her legal team had put forward um to terminate you know the uh to once again terminate you know the fines and stuff that she's accrued um as punishment for refusing to participate in the grand jury and instead um yesterday um there was a order published by the judge that said um by order dated march 12th 2020 after finding that the business of the grand jury had concluded the court dismissed grand jury the grand jury upon consideration of the court's um, may 16th 2019 order the motion and the court's uh, march 12th 2020 order discharging grand the grand jury um, the court finds that Miss Manning's appearance before the grand jury is no longer needed in light of uh, which her detention no longer serves any course of purpose. The court further finds that enforcement of the accrued conditional fines would not be punitive, but rather necessary to the course of purpose of the court's civil contempt order. Um, accordingly, um, it is hereby ordered that Chelsea Manning be and should hereby is immediately released from the custody of the attorney general. Um, and in, uh, as a side note, Jeremy Hammond, who was also called to give testimony in the grand jury and was then jailed for civil contempt, um, he was also uh, released from the custody of the attorney general. Unfortunately, he still has to serve uh, a little bit of the remainder of his sentence, so he's not out of jail yet, but he is released from participation in the grand jury. Um, so yeah, this was really great news because this basically means that Chelsea Manning, um, after she's, uh, recovered in the hospital is able to go back to her normal life. She will not be returning to jail. Um, what's also really interesting is that this order states that the reason that she was let go is that the grand jury was dismissed which is a big deal. Um, we don't know why, what exactly precipitated it because they, the judge doesn't say why the business of the grand jury had concluded. Um, there's multiple theories about why that could be. For example, um, after the trial, uh, the initial hearings for the trial of Assange in London, which um, the, the prosecution focused very heavily on uh, Chelsea Manning's culpability or lack thereof and the actions that she took and a lot of stuff that had already been debated in her court martial many years ago and in fact they were spreading a lot of falsehoods that had 
you know, she had not been convicted of certain things or had not been found to be responsible for certain things. And the prosecution made the stupid argument that, well, we don't have to actually, you know, we don't have to accept the conclusion of her court martial, even though they spent like literally years confining her, you know, torturing her until she eventually got to her trial and, you know, so many resources went into that and they're just saying, well, we don't have to accept their conclusions, so we're just going to spread falsehoods that have already been debunked. Um, so that was, I mean, at least from my end and a lot of the public's perspective, that was pretty embarrassing for them because Assange's legal team really fought back against a lot of the things they were saying and showed it to be a lot of bullshit. And so it's possible that maybe they were embarrassed by that and their arguments were shown to have very little weight. And so maybe they came to the conclusion that um, Chelsea Manning's testimony was not as valuable to them going forward if they could see that the defense would put up a fight, and a very good fight. Um, so it's possible they might have discharged her for that reason because they weighed the consequences of the continuing public backlash and the fact that she's clearly not going to cooperate um, based on her principles. So it, they probably just weighed the options and decided it, was, it wasn't worth it to keep her anymore. I don't know. That's just a theory. Uh, we, we just really don't know why the grand jury closed and whether... It, it could be reopened later. It's possible that they just didn't, they wanted to put cases like this to the side and focus resources elsewhere because of the coming pandemic. Who knows what the reason is? Um, but yeah, so Jeremy Hammond is going to be released. I, I can't remember how much time he still has on his sentence, but he'll be released at some point soon. And Chelsea Manning will be released once she leaves the hospital. So that's really great because uh, this is another thing that we've been waiting a year for um, to get an answer on. Yeah, the, Jeremy is really what kind of is, is throwing me for a loop here because it's like what's going on with multiple kind of things being unwound at the same time. You know what I mean? Well, the, I mean, Jeremy was released because he was called to give testimony in the same grand jury. So it was clearly going to be about WikiLeaks because if you want testimony from Chelsea Manning and Jeremy Hammond, both of which are alleged sources, um, clearly it's, a, it's you know, focus. so they are related. Um, there's no question there. It's because they were called to participate in the same grand jury and that grand jury was dismissed. So oh, Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that sleep deprivation is showing more. Well, I mean, it is like, hey, like all this stuff, like uh, India is lifting the ban, and like uh, these guys are coming out. Uh, this, uh, you know, it's good to see Chelsea and uh, Assange being able to get out of there, and uh, that's a great thing. This is something that has been like an injustice for a long time, similar to just people in India not being able to use Bitcoin, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's something where really. To me, like we were talking about this before, the speculation on like why would they spit a halt to all this? I mean, there's so much going on, big macro picture for 2020 election, but ultimately, I mean, like the whole reason they originally put Chelsea in uh, prison was they said she was uh, helping with Russia, right? Wasn't it like she was involved with the Russia Gate stuff? Uh, no, I don't think so. The, the reason they put her in jail is because she was called to she was called to give testimony in the grand jury and she refused to on a number of different bases like the fact that they were asking for testimony that she had already given in her court martial and for some reason they were just ignoring that. Um, she also objected to the existence of grand juries in general because she dis she disagrees with there being secret courts. She doesn't think that you can get just through that, no, I obviously agree. Um, was it Assange then? Like they were yes. So the the government hasn't come out. I don't think they've come out directly and said this, but yes, it's it's basically there's no other reasonable explanation. The grand jury was about Assange. So the the idea is that they were getting these people. They were trying to coerce these people into testifying against him, so that when he eventually, if they're successful in extraditing him, then 
they would have they would have evidence from these people to convict him. Okay. Well, yeah, I was thinking maybe uh maybe it was like they were saying Assange did something with Russia to help tamper with the election and that's how they got him in custody and then in turn was like, okay, well, now how are we going to get something to say else? I don't know. To me, I'm just thinking about there's a lot of stuff going on in 2020 and there's a lot of egg on the face of people trying to prosecute people for political crimes. And that's what this whole thing has been the whole time. So it's a good thing they dropped it. Yeah, I mean, Chelsea was at the time of the 2016 election, she was in prison. So there's no way they could accuse her of that. Obviously, Assange has been accused of that, but they're not trying, they're not at all trying to prosecute him for that. In fact, there was this whole rumor going around that the Trump administration was going to give him a pardon uh, in exchange for him saying that Russia was not involved in the uh, DNC leaks or the release of the Hillary Clinton emails, which is stupid on its face because Assange said many years ago that Russia was not the source and they were not involved in it. So the idea that they would offer him a pardon for something that he's already said makes no sense. And it turns out that it wasn't Trump making the offer. It was an ex congressman and there was never any, like nothing was ever done to make that an actual offer. So it was just bogus, bogus news. Well, thank God they'll be getting out of there soon. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, so the update on Assange, um, I did talk a little bit about what happened um, at the trial, which I was paying heavily attention to during that week. Um, So if you want to hear some tidbits about what was said there and the craziness, you should watch the uh, special edition that we did with Matt um, just a few weeks ago. Was that last weekend or two weekends ago? I don't want to... um... Time has ceased to mean anything in my brain. I, don't know. I want to say it was two weeks because it was a couple yeah. weeks ago. So, yeah, if you want to hear like some specifics about what was said, um, but basically since then, the International Bar Association has published a statement, I think it was March 10th, um, and it kind of gives a summary of some of the things, like the most egregious things that happened. Um, so the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute condemns the reported mistreatment of Julian Assange during his United States extradition trial in February 2020 and urges the government of the United States of the United Kingdom to take action to protect him. According to his lawyers, Mr. Assange was handcuffed 11 times, stripped naked twice, and searched. His case files confiscated after the first day of the hearing and had his request to sit with his lawyers during the trial rather than in a dock surrounded by bulletproof glass denied. The UK hearing, which began on Monday, 24th of February 2020 at Woolwich Crown Court in London, UK, will decide whether the WikiLeaks founder, Mr. Assange, will be extradited to the United States, where he is wanted on 18 charges of attempted hacking and breaches of the 1917 Espionage Act. He faces allegations of collaborating with former U.S. Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning to leak classified documents, including exposing alleged war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq. By the way, there's a lot of stuff happening on that recently, like those both of those governments taking more interest in, you know, bringing about trials that investigate war crimes by the United States. Um, the hearing was adjourned after four days with proceedings set to resume on the 18th of May, 2020. Um, in between the ta- that time, I can't remember the exact dates, but there is a date, I think at the end of March, mid-March to end of March, and an, also one in April. I can't remember the exact dates, but there's, there's supposed to be like two case management hearings. Um, it's really up in the air about how those are going to be handled because coronavirus, um, I assume they're, they're going to be short. So it's not, it's not something that people should consider like urgent to attend. Um, that's not going to really start until May 18th. Uh, and the reason being is, uh, basically the U S prosecution team said that they wouldn't be available until then. So that's why there's this giant break. But yeah, the greatest, the greatest risk that I see right now is obviously Assange 
has um, been confined and imprisoned for a very long time, several years. He has a number of health issues, um, both just from, you know, being confined for that long in a small space where he can't exercise or get sunlight, but also from various uh, things that um, he's alleged were done to him by, you know, prison staff at previous prisons. There was an incident when he was first imprisoned in the UK where he thinks that um, a prison guard or someone deliberately put a hard object into food that he was given, and then he ended up breaking his tooth, and he hasn't received any treatment for that as far as I know. So um, he also has a number of other uh, conditions that were... um, that were talked about by some physicians that actually got to visit him in the embassy, but unfortunately he was unable to get permission from the UK government to go to a hospital. So his health is not great. He's lost a lot of weight. Um, I think in the last couple of weeks, um, I've heard that he's since recovered um, some weight, but not sufficiently. And the fact that, you know, he was having to sit for several hours in a courtroom where he can't, he literally can't hear his own trial. He's trapped in a glass box and the audio equipment in this court is insanely bad. Like this would be grounds for mistrial in the US, but this is the UK where rule of law doesn't, it applies even less than in the US. So... Um, The greatest threat that I see to him right now is that the UK is going to really botch their, you know, response to the coronavirus. It's going to get into the prison. And if he's already at compromised health um, status, then he's he's like at really great risk of of, you know, either the 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 prisoner stage awry and he gets injured in that or he catches it himself and he's his immune system isn't um up to scratch to defend it so that's what i'm most worried about at this stage yeah corona is no joke and especially somebody that's been in that kind of uh state for so long it definitely a weakened immune system yeah it's just i uh, i mean i can't see like there is no way in my mind all of the the types of legal processes and stuff don't just start getting put on hold when this gets really bad unless somewhere is able to just really stop it from getting out of control there yeah i mean prison populations getting that would spread like a nightmare and then who's going to guard them i guess you got to get some people that are infected to guard them Oh man, we're coming back around. Luckily, I think that uh, that wraps us up for today, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's 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 all for the day. Final thoughts time. Um, I'm gonna play uh, medical expert, and I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about that. Uh, I just want to pass on a few pieces of advice that I have seen floating out of Japan and South Korea. Make sure that you're taking vitamin C and iodine if you can. And it's, I, I don't really know the, the efficacy of this, but I keep seeing this being circulated, attributed to doctors in Japan, advising just drinking something every 15 minutes. It doesn't matter what, with the idea that you wash anything that has gotten into the back of your throat, into your stomach, rather than letting it work its way into your lungs. And my thinking is, um, it's drinking stuff. You do that. Um, it's not going to make anything worse. So do what you can and don't be stupid. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, uh, probably some sound advice. I mean, right now, uh, I know everybody kind of, takes like different things there's like elderberry i mean like myself i take zinc and d3 but i also take a multivitamin and fish oil and probiotics but mainly uh exercise and get eight hours of sleep for sure um and also like uh, just something that i've got to do because the past couple of days have been pretty crazy is like remember to just kind of like uh, take some time to sit down and quiet your brain and let the stress kind of work itself out because uh stress 
can influence your sleep, which can influence your appetite, which can influence the way you feel, which can influence your immune system. So it's like all this stuff is interconnected. Like just make sure you're doing the general stuff to make sure your general well-being is taken care of. Like you're uh, not just like all your foods needs are met, but you're also uh, entertaining yourself and also giving yourself time to relax and, uh, you know, just uh, try and take it easy in this time and uh, don't expose yourself and, you know, we'll get through this. Days keep moving. Mm -hmm. So my final thought is that I watched uh, the movie A Hidden Life the other day, and it and it's basically the story of an Austrian farmer who, um, he decided not to enlist and fight for the Nazis in World War II, and as a consequence, his entire family and his children were shunned not only by, obviously, the Nazis and the government, but his own neighbors and family members. They like were constantly scorning them and yelling at them and getting into fights. And he ended up uh, being imprisoned and eventually sent to Berlin and executed for that. And the movie ended um with a quote from marianne evans aka george Eliot, uh which says for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and the rest in unvisited tombs yeah get ready to find a lot of good movies and stuff to watch you're gonna have a lot of time if you can lock down at home and I guess you got one more to tack on, Rick. Yeah, uh, just something that I've been working with uh, recently kind of maybe take us off in a little bit of a direction where we should be thinking about what, you know, the future and how exactly this stuff is going to work. And like we were talking about some interesting developments and, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, since my little hiatus that I've been on, I actually been working uh, on the Ellen Strike uh, beta testing this app and it's just freaking awesome man i find myself using lightning on a lot of you know places that i hadn't normally like you know i'm doing stuff on satoshi's place i'm i'm, I'm feeding some chickens it's some it's some really fun things and uh you know interestingly like i've now seen like oh you know with the fodl app it's like if i'm gonna take ubers and i know i'm gonna take ubers for the next few days or something i'll just like use the lightning option to uh get sats back and uh you know do it that way and also there's uh this uh twitter account at bitcoin beach where uh this person this individual is accepting bitcoin through the strike app and uh accepting bitcoin and uh using it as a merchant and i think it's gonna help s scale the network and lightning in interesting fascinating ways and i thought i'd do that live on air right now in my final thought by purchasing something off the Bitcoin Shirt Co. company uh, website, BitcoinShirt.co. I mean, like, it's a website I've heard about a lot about, but I haven't really checked too much out. Here, hold on. Let me move this mic over with me. And I just want a disclaimer. I did not pay Rick to do this. <laughs> no, you didn't. I mean, this is you your really worst didn't. nightmare. <laughs> I said I wanted to do this because I had seen people wearing your uh, Genesis block uh, swag, and I was like, damn, I want some Genesis block swag. And I wanted to talk about this app and what's been going on. And I see you guys have like a pay with Bitcoin and lightning option through BTC pay server. And so I figured I'd do that right here and kind of demonstrate how easy this is. Like I picked out this beautiful Bitcoin original Genesis block, 15 ounce black coffee mug. So I could drink my coffee and think about the Genesis block. This will be great. Okay. So I got everything placed in so I could just pull up the invoice. All right. I have read and agreed to your terms of service, Shino, are you guys. And uh, <laughs> all right, so there it is. I got my invoice, and it says uh, pay with Bitcoin, but I'm going to switch that to pay with Bitcoin Lightning, and it pulls up an LN invoice, and right now I've got my Strike app open, and it looks like it's going to cost me about uh, $18, which I've got 19 in here, but I'm going to deposit an extra dollar just to be sure on all this because you never I like to have some leftover to pay the birds later so I'm depositing a dollar for my bank account right now and boom now I can scan the QR code all right and now I've ordered a coffee mug from the bitcoinshirt.co site with lightning and paid with bitcoin and you guys got some bitcoin and it was actually funded through my bitcoin account and some amazing channel work 
And, uh, you know, this is where, like, it's kind of hard to say exactly where all this development is going because there's so many different ways to move forward with Bitcoin and spending and savings. And people want to say it's this technology and that technology. Like, the point is the development's moving forward. It's in people's hands. And we're going to find new amazing use cases for it. And one of those is you can buy some pretty awesome swag from Bitcoin Shirt Co. And sooner rather than later, you'll be using the Stray Cap too. So uh, be on the lookout for that one. And you just agreed to the contract we have buried in our terms of service. You have six months to pee on Donald Trump's legs or all of your Bitcoin is legally our property. <laughs> Claimed under the contract clause buried in the terms of service. Congratulations. You have also won a taxable event. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, at least I got my Genesis Block Coffee mug. Actually, there is no taxable event because as far as Rick's concerned, he never touched or had or took possession of Bitcoin, which is really the awesome thing about that. Oh, right. Kaboom. Yeah, that's the yeah. whole point of that thing. Yeah. Oops. Exactly. So there was no taxable event here. Like this was all problem solved with Lightning and Bitcoin here. Well, I guess. Uh, yeah. We thank are you. great thank marketers. You. <laughs> Thank you for your money, Rick. Um, and I guess punks out there, we'll catch you next time. We're back for the season. And be smart and safe out there. Adios. How feet are saying. Later, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, you need to have a voice, you're yet. Yeah, you need to have a voice, you're yet.